Cornelius is an author and lead staff developer at Teachers College Press Reading and Writing Project. Without further ado, Cornelius Miner. Wow. So um, thank you all for coming. I'm really excited to be here. And I think I have to start by saying last year was my first ILA. Um, and I was invited to be one of the featured speakers last year. And so in keeping with the conference theme, I was asked to talk about digital literacy, which is a passion of mine. And it was my very first keynote at an international event. And the hype in my family was real. <laughs> <laughs> Like, my mom and them, my wife, my cousins, we were rolling to ILA 16 with a posse. And, um, and, um, and, and so I finished writing my talk days before the conference, and I remember closing my word processor and logging onto Facebook to relax. Um, but relaxation would elude me on that day. Um, my feed was alive with concern and helplessness and rage. Me and thousands of others watched in silent dystopian horror as Philando Castile bled to death in front of his little girl. Traffic stop, cop, gun, black person dead. We who mourned for Trayvon and Sandra and Eric and Tamir and scores of the unnamed, we know how this story goes. It is America's favorite rerun. I was teaching summer courses um, <clears throat> in the summer of 2014 when the police left Mike Brown's lifeless body in the street. And um, strangely, this did not surprise me. America does a wonderful job of reminding each generation of black folks that this is not our country. Langston lamented it in his poem. They send me to eat in the kitchen. As a middle school student, I saw his verse play out in 1991 to the rhythm of police batons as Rodney King lay prone on the California pavement. They send me to eat in the kitchen. And for some of us, there's brutality for breakfast. Grief-stricken by my country's consistent unwillingness to recognize the humanity of people that look like me, I could barely move. But I came to work, like many of us do, for the children. Um, I work on an amazing team, probably a lot of children, and this is not unique to my organization, but even these numbers are a form of brutality. I walked into school that day, visibly carrying my hurt, wondering what I would say. I needed allies, and my colleagues were eating scones. Not a word about the world that was crashing down around me and my students. Cinnamon scones, I can still smell them. They send me to eat in the kitchen. We get bullets, you get scones. A year later, <clears throat> when Sandra Bland was collected and killed for asking a question, my colleagues responded with similar silence. We who champion critical thinking, we teach black and brown girls to question authority every day and when one dies in police custody for exercising common core standard number one, <clears throat> we don't have anything to say. So that morning they all ate their breakfast and tried not to look at me. I think it was muffins that morning. We get dead, you get muffins. ILA 2016 was right after Castile and right after Dallas, and my talk was already written, but I would play this game no longer. I would not be one of two or six people of color worried about my children in a room full of white folks shaking hands and eating scones. The world was too much for me that weekend. I sent a letter to the ILA executive board and I explained my situation. I asked them for the time and space to discuss the things that were heavy on my heart. And then I sent a letter to my homie Sarah Ahmed because I was scared. <laughs> and I told her, I don't even work for ILA, but I think they're going to fire me. <laughs> but they did not. Um, <laughs> Steve Sai and the good people here gave me a room and an hour. And in that room, in that hour, I learned that these things are heavy on your heart, too. I'm a seventh grade teacher. And the state-sanctioned killing of people of color 
is a literacy issue. I'll say it again. The state-sanctioned killing of people of color is a literacy issue. It is one thing to be dead from other forms of violence or disease or accident. Those things are tragic, but to be dead at the hands of the same government constitutionally designed to educate and protect you, this is not citizenship. We cannot teach children to conjugate verbs if they are dead or if they are carrying the trauma of lost parents, family members, friends. But this issue is bigger than police violence. The police are simply the public face of a system designed to ensure that poor folks, women, people of color, gay people, and people with disabilities get less. We know these systems by name, racism, sexism, classism, ableism. Racism is not your surly uncle from Alabama. Sexism is not some dude bro in a fraternity. In all of my work, I stress to students that racism and sexism, these things are not personality traits, they are systems. They are rules, practices, sensibilities, and customs that lead to unequal outcomes for specific subsets of people. Women, people of color, gay people, poor people, people with disabilities. Again, racism is not some dude in a white hood. Racism is the reality that brown children with identical test scores to white children get selected for gifted programs a tenth of the rate as their white counterparts. Racism is that those children whose parents pay the same taxes as white parents will often attend schools that offer fewer programs. Sexism is not just Donald Trump. Yeah, I said it. <laughs> <laughs> sexism. <laughs> sexism is the reality that though I labor intensely to ensure that the girls I teach graduate, that labor is undermined by a workforce that will pay them between 87 and 92 cents for every dollar that a man earns for equal work. I hope you see where I'm going here. I am interested in disrupting systems. Like the police, teachers, despite our personal interest, are the public face of a system that ensures that some people get less. You know the literacy rates, the graduation statistics, I don't have to tell you. Police bullets kill instantly, ours kill in 12 years. I wanna disrupt that. And I think you're here because you do too. And we need tools. You've seen the news, the year since last year, ILA 16 has been chapter one of the Hunger Games. This is hyperbole, of course, but in the last 12 months, we've seen increased class stratification, environmental decay, economic instability, racial unease, and the attempted erasure of rights for gay people and disabled people. These things can be avoided. As teachers, I'm sure you know this. Most days, we are the smartest person in the room. It is not enough to hope that the next generation solves this. Things will not get better until we teach them how. It is on us to grow men who do not exploit the labor of women, straight kids who understand and work toward rights and protections for gay people, and white kids who understand that it is not about having a black friend. It is about divesting completely from racist systems. I don't have answers, but I have you. Thanks for coming today. My name's Cornelius, I'm from Brooklyn, and together I think we can do this. Thanks. <laughs>
was, as I said in the piece I did for This American Life on Michael Brown, most black children will not be killed by the police, but they will um, be stunted by a separate and unequal educational system. And I think this is what we're here to talk about today. Um, so I've entitled my talk, uh, Literacy is Liberation, because um, it was kind of fortuitous when I got asked to speak at this conference. I'm working on a book on school segregation, and I've been thinking a lot about literacy lately, and a lot about literacy in a way that I had never thought about it before. I think, like most Americans, we assume that nearly everyone, if not everyone in this country, is literate, that everyone can read and therefore can take part in our democracy, and that's simply not true. Uh, I spend lots of times in classrooms where that is not true. And so I've been making uh, a lot of connections between literacy and citizenship and what it means to not have literacy in a country where it is necessary to take part um, in the politics of our country, in the economy of our country, um, you must have literacy. If those of you, any of you follow me on Twitter, one thing that you'll know is I say I write about race from 1619. So 1619 is the year that the first Africans were brought to these shores to be enslaved, which of course is a long time before we even become a country. We have already decided that we are going to have a caste system that puts black people on the bottom and deprives them not only of citizenship, but of their humanity. And I always joke with my um, editors, because I always say I, I keep trying to go further and further back in time in my writing until I actually can get 1619 in a story. I haven't managed to get there yet, but I promise if you follow me, I will get there. Um, so as I'm researching my book on school segregation, I'm actually going all the way back to slavery. And so today, you guys are lucky, we're not gonna go to 1619, but we're definitely gonna go back to uh, the 17th century, or 18th century, the 1700s, because I'm gonna try to build a case for you about the urgency of literacy for liberation and equality in this country before we go on stage together. So let's start with, uh, president of the United States who happened to also be an enslaver, who happened to also enslave his own children, Thomas Jefferson. And what Thomas Jefferson understood was that education in a, in a democracy was critical. That if you wanted to have a nation, you could not have the masses be ignorant or they could not take part in their government. So he said, if a nation expects to be ignorant and free, it expects what never was and what never will be. Which kind of sounds like a Dr. Seuss rhyme. Um, <laughs> and so he understood. And so in 1787, in the Commonwealth of Virginia, Thomas Jefferson decides that white children should get free education, um, at least three years of free education. And those who showed a particular talent, and if they were male as well, would then be able to continue on in school. The problem was 40% of children in the Commonwealth of Virginia were enslaved black people. And they were not included in this desire to have an educated populace. They were not to be included in the making of citizens in this country, 40% of the children in that state. So from the founding of education, of public education in this school, there's been two philosophies, one of democracy and one of oppression. And I think we all know who the education for democracy was for and who the education of oppression were for. So very early on, as we are understanding that building a literate citizenry, that we will separate ourselves from Europe and from other places that had class and caste, that we were going to educate our citizens and that every, every white citizen would get a free public education. It was understanding this was for the common good of America, America being defined as white. And very quickly you began to see states criminalizing literacy among black people, sometimes even black people who were not in slavery, but almost uniformly it was a criminal act to teach a black person who was enslaved to read. So think about what that means, and why would it be a criminal act to teach someone in slavery to read? You see states all across the South doing this. So I've spent a lot of time looking at how did the enslaved react to this? What did they understand about this effort to keep them unable to read and therefore unable to exercise any rights or even to think about freedom, right? You have to have words to be able to think about certain concepts. Once you become educated, then you no longer accept the way that you are being treated. You start to question the way that you live. 
Um, as they, enslavers were teaching enslaved people the Bible, they were only teaching them certain passages out of the Bible, those passages which would make them accepting of their bondage. The fear was if you taught them to read the whole Bible, they might actually want to rise up like the Israelites, and that may be a problem. So this was a, a, a quote from a former slave. And he said, we did not learn to read nor write as it was against the law for any person to teach any slave to read. And any slave taught writing suffered the penalty of having his forefinger cut from his right hand. Yet there were some who could read and write. So what that tells you, and having your forefinger cut was not the worst. People were killed for trying to learn to read, for teaching their children to read, or for teaching others in the community to read. Yet they did it anyway. That fundamental desire for literacy, despite what we still believe today, that black people somehow are the only people on the face of the earth who don't value education. That somehow we are the only people on the face of the earth who don't value reading, who don't want to be smart. This starts way back in slavery when we are told that enslaved people just want to be ignorant. They cannot be taught to read. They do not desire to learn to read. Yet, you have people who are risking their lives to teach literacy, to teach reading. And in fact, in places like Georgia, during slavery, there were secret schools that operated. There was a school in, in Savannah, Georgia, that operated for 30 years on a plantation underneath the overseer's nose, and they never knew it. They were willing to die for this right to read. Because they believed, as this formerly enslaved man said, that there is one sin that slavery committed against me which I will never forgive. It robbed me of my education. And I think about this. I've studied a lot about slavery. I've been to sugarcane plantations in Louisiana. There was a lot of horrific things that happened during slavery. But the thing that he says he could not forgive was to be robbed of his education. And that's because black Americans have always understood education and literacy to be freedom. Where white Americans see education as something that will give them, increase their status as individuals, as something that will earn them wealth, that will give them a proximity to power. Black Americans have always understood fundamentally that to be educated and to be literate was to be free. That you could read your freedom papers, that you could challenge laws, that you can vote. All of these things were tied into freedom. And so it actually is black Americans in the South who bring the common schools, who bring public schools to the South. Public schools had begun to proliferate in the North, but in the South, only the very wealthy white were able to get an education, and they were educated in private schools. And it is after the end of slavery that black Americans are saying, we need to have universal education that is paid for publicly and is provided for all children. And they are refusing to work on plantations if they are not providing for the education of their children. That is an amazingly courageous act of resistance. These are people who have no power in a society and no legal rights who are using the power of their labor and withholding their labor to demand that uh, plantation owners provide education for their children. And because of that, as their children start to get education, poor white families are not appreciative of the fact that their children are not getting education. And suddenly, you, you find that the governments are having to provide education for white children and black children. This is not a commonly known story. So as we think about, again, this, this mythology about how black people feel about education and how black people are not uh, desirous of education, um, we should probably give credit that common schools come to the South simply because of that desire for black Americans to get an education, but also not hoarding their opportunity for themselves, but believing that education should be universal. It should even be given to those who seek to oppress them. And you see a tremendous rise in black literacy following the Civil War. So 1860, about 95% of black Americans in the South are illiterate. And by 1910, just 30%. You are seeing elderly people going into classrooms and schoolhouses that are largely being funded not with uh, tax dollars, because many places were still refusing to educate, um, to use tax dollars to educate black children. They were pulling their money on their own and starting schools and funding their own schools to educate their community. But that proved to be problematic, because planters did not want an educated population of black people in the South. 
They wanted black people who were going to pick cotton and pick tobacco and be domestic servants. And you don't want to work 14 hours in a field when you have the ability to learn and read about a different life and to aspire to have a different life. So very quickly after the period of Reconstruction, we began to see a period of withdrawal, which is called the Great Nadir, which is where these hard fought rights that black Americans uh, got after the Civil War, you see the introduction of black codes all across the South that are now taking them away. Black schools are shuttered. Um, black people are no longer allowed to attend schools in many cases. And this doesn't just happen in the South. So in places like Connecticut, in Massachusetts, which is the home of the, of the common school, all across the North, we see communities that are also refusing to educate black children. Or when they provide education for black children, it only goes to grammar school. There are no middle schools or high schools for black children. And very specifically, they have decided that they're going to provide an education that will educate black children to their lot in life. The most fascinating thing has been to read they explicitly, the way that white leadership and white communities explicitly say what their plan is, which is if we teach them this higher level of thinking, they're not going to want to stay in this field all day. So we need to educate them to their state in life. We need to educate them on how to be a domestic worker, how to be a bricklayer. We don't want to educate people who think they can be teachers or lawyers or doctors, because then they'll be unhappy and they're going to be they may push back against the system. And then we understand, we come to understand how important literacy is for exercising your right as a citizen in this country. This is a, a literacy test in Louisiana, which of course we know after the Civil War, the Constitution says you cannot deny someone the right to vote based on their race. Black people, black men in particular, um, get the franchise. So we have to come up with different ways to deny the franchise because the franchise is the fundamental way that one exercises your rights in a democracy. They turn to literacy tests. That is not accidental. If you are not educating your citizenry, then you keep them from exercising the vote by requiring them to prove that they are educated. So we see school segregation all across the country. We see separate but unequal schools. And then, of course, in 1954, we get the landmark Supreme Court ruling, which is considered probably the most important Supreme Court ruling in the history of our country, and certainly the most important ruling uh, in the 20th century. Most people have never read the ruling, however. How many of you guys have read Brown v. Board? So we all know that this, this um, ruling exists. Most people think they know what it says. Most of us actually don't know what it says. Brown v. Board of Education is not about unequal resources. It actually never mentions resources. It certainly never mentions test scores, which is the way that we now try to evaluate educational equality. It mentions citizenship. Brown v. Board of Education understands that an equal and integrated education is the only means by which a community of people who are on the bottom of racial caste gain their full citizenship. And it understands that education plays a unique role in a democratic society. It is perhaps the most important function of state and local government. It is the foundation of good citizenship. And then it goes on to say that it is doubtful that any child may reasonably be expected to succeed in life if he is denied the opportunity of an education. Now with that said, the Supreme Court would later rule that there is no constitutional right to an education. And these days, the only place that um, education is constitutionally guaranteed are in state constitutions. So on the one hand, we are recognizing that this is one of the most important institutions in our country, but then we are saying that children have no right to it. So I'm going to jump to 2016. And this is what classrooms look like all across this country today. I've pretty much spent all of my time on the segregation beat now. And I'm writing about the way that in 1954, we made a province to our school children that no matter what race you were, you were entitled to an equal education. And that it was a constitutional right. And then we very quickly walked away. So 1953, 2016 in Tuscaloosa, Alabama. Lest you think it's a southern problem, which northerners love to do. <laughs> the most segregated school system in the country is New York City. 
It's also third most segregated for housing. You want to go down your top 10 list of most segregated school systems, you're going to have to get to number eight before you find one in the South. So we should be very clear that this problem is a national problem. This classroom on the left is in the Bronx. That's the same picture from Tuscaloosa. And the question is, why was that not OK? But somehow this is. And somehow, we now want to delude ourselves that that segregation way back then was bad. But this is natural. This is just where people live. This isn't problematic because we don't have a law saying that it should be so. The problem is, if you look at why NAACP first begins to challenge Brown, it was because you could predict the resources and the quality of that education by the color of the skin of the kids in the school. That has not changed. It's not saying that white children in this country, there are not some white children who don't get a good education, but if there are black children nearby or brown children nearby, they're always getting a worse one. That is racial caste. So in 2016, there was a lawsuit, a class action federal lawsuit filed against the city of Detroit and the state of Michigan. And what it argued was that black children were being denied their constitutional right to literacy. Now this is one of those moments where as a journalist you're like, great for journalism, bad for humanity. I have been writing about Detroit. My book, the narrative of my book is going to be based in Detroit. And the reason for that was Detroit was a site of a landmark law, um, Supreme Court ruling in 1974, 20 years after Brown v. Board, that begins to reverse um, the forward progress on school desegregation. In that ruling, the court overturned a lower court judge who said it, he was going to force a metro-wide integration plan with the suburbs. Those of you who know Detroit's history, you know that Detroit experienced a great deal of white flight. It had a great deal of housing segregation. And so you were left with an all-black urban school system surrounded by white suburbs. And so even though they found that the state and the city had intentionally violated the rights, the constitutional rights of black children, the Supreme Court would not allow a desegregation plan that went out to those white suburbs. You can't integrate a city if there are no white children left in the city with whom to integrate with. And in that ruling, that made it almost impossible to get school integration in the North. Because as you all know, in the North, one only has to move two miles across a city line to get into an all-white district if you want to avoid being in a diverse or integrated classroom. And if you can't order a metro-wide desegregation plan, you can get no desegregation. So that's why you'll find your most segregated school systems. I mean, think of any city, Chicago, Milwaukee, Philadelphia, Newark, New York, Cleveland. They are also segregated, not because the segregation is happening between schools, but because there are no white children left in the school district. So this is why I was writing about school desegregation. And I was knowing that I was going to be tracing the arc of the story going all the way back to slavery um, because I actually am making the argument that our schools in this country are not broken. Our schools are operating as designed. And I think that is the fundamental truth that we have to walk away from today and then figure out you're not going to fix the system. The system has, to, you have to start the system from scratch because it is not broken. And that's kind of why I start all the way back with the founding of public schools in this country with the understanding that they were never intended to educate black children at all initially. And once they were forced to educate black children, it was never to allow them to receive the same education that would allow them to compete with white children. And this was literally written out. We cannot have them competing for the same jobs as our children. So you come to a city like Detroit, modern day Detroit, and it is clear that that is the educational system that still stands. That the education that the children in Detroit, that black and brown children in Los Angeles, in Chicago, in small towns down south are receiving, is a type of education that will never allow them to compete for the top and important and high paying jobs in this country that they will never be able to compete with white children because they are not receiving the same education as white children. So this lawsuit, which I, there is no constitutional right to literacy in this country. They are trying to make new case law. I think they were hoping we may have a different Supreme Court than we're going to get now, but clearly the election didn't turn out that way. 
And what they found in Detroit, and I think this is, this is how segregation works in this country. Those that have never have to see what it's really like for those who don't. You move out of the city, you may come in there to work, but you drive by all of those downtrodden communities on the highway, and you never have to stop it. You never have to think about what's happening in there. The classrooms in Detroit are abysmal. You have students who've never taken home a textbook in 13 years, who don't have enough chairs, who have moldy food, where the water is not drinkable in their schools, who are being assigned third grade worksheets when they're in high school, but that's because they're reading at a second grade level. Now ask yourself, if you are reading at a second grade level, how do you do your science homework? How do you do your social studies homework? How do you do a complicated math problem? We all understand that literacy is literally foundational to learning everything else. I talked to a young man who graduated second in his class, and he said, I've never, he, he couldn't, he lives in Michigan, he never applied to a state any of the state colleges. He applied to historically black colleges, and I, I asked, was there a reason? And he said, I've never been assigned a novel my entire high school career. How am I going to go to a white institution and compete with those kids? I talked to another young lady who was taking four English classes her senior year because she had failed freshman English, sophomore English, junior English, and senior English. And somehow, they thought the solution to that was to put her in all four Englishes at once, and she graduated on time. And what she told me, I said, she said, I used to want to be a nurse. And I said, well, you haven't even graduated yet. You're graduating in two months. Why would you say you used to want to be a nurse? And she said, I can't read. How am I going to be a nurse? I get emotional now just thinking about it. Because I looked at her, and I couldn't tell her, yes, you can. And I realized that what these children understand, they understand how much we value their education by the schools we have built for them. And then we say these kids don't want to learn. These kids don't value their education. They don't want any better. They want what we've shown them that they're worth. And it's hard to tell a kid to dream higher when she's in a school and they don't even have heat and they can't be bothered to fix the broken windows. And they play sports teams, right? So they go across to Gross Point that has imported marble in their schools. And they see what those kids get. And they see that those kids look different than they look. And they understand why. And then we tell them, just study hard. You can't teach yourself to read. As a matter of fact, they don't even, this, this uh, the child who graduated second in his class, when he didn't have textbooks, he said, I tried to go to the library to check out novels, but the library branches in his neighborhood were closed. They were shut down because, as you all know, Detroit is suffering fiscally. There aren't even street lights in many communities. So we build all these hurdles for these kids, and then we tell them, if you want to make it, you have to overcome all of these hurdles. And if you don't, it's because you just didn't want it bad enough. I remember one time I wrote a story about um, a, a young man who wanted to be a doctor, and he gets to into a pre-med program and realizes he'd never seen the periodic table in his life. And I, got a, I had a reader who wrote in to me who said, well, why didn't he just go to the library and teach himself physics then? That's insane. That's one of those times where like, you write the email and then you don't send it. <laughs> right? Because you're like, this shit is going to come back to haunt me if I send this out. But who would ever? I could not teach myself physics. And certainly as a high school student, I'm not going to. One, I didn't even, he didn't even know what he wasn't being taught. Like, how do you know something exists that you've never been exposed to? But this is the expectations that we place on black and brown children, is you better find a way. Yet, for when we are middle class and when we are white, we do everything understanding that the school matters, right? When it comes to poor black and brown children, we say it is just the parents who matter. But if it was just the parents who matter, you would put your kid in any school because you knew if you were a good parent, your kid would be OK. These are circumstances that would not be tolerated for most white children in this country. And these are circumstances that are normal for many, many black and brown children in this country. 
So the state of Michigan responds to this literacy lawsuit. This is like, to me, the most brilliant part of this lawsuit, is it forces the state to actually argue that it is not responsible for teaching children to read. And that is the argument that the state of Michigan is making. It is saying that, yes, education is compulsory. If you don't send your kid to jail, I mean, if you don't send your kid to school, you're going to jail. You have no choice but to send your child to school. Your child must be educated. But we don't have to actually teach your child to read. Literacy is a component or particular outcome of education, not a right granted to individuals by the Constitution, which is factually true. But I can't wait till next month when we're in that courtroom and state officials have to sit up there and argue that they don't have to teach children to read even though they force them to go to school. So these are children who are fighting. There's something tremendously powerful and tremendously painful about understanding that in 2017, black children are fighting for that very same thing that their enslaved ancestors fought for, which was a basic right to literacy, to be able to exercise their basic citizenship rights. If you can't read, you cannot fill out a job application. You cannot read a voter's ballot. You cannot go into the military. You certainly cannot go to college. What you can do is flip someone's burgers for $7 an hour. You can clean someone's house. You can mow someone's lawn. And we are creating yet another generation of children who are being educated for their lot in life, not to go above the station that we have created for them, not for lack of want, not for lack of intellect, but simply because we choose it to be that way. And the thing that you'll find is when I talk to their parents, their parents receive that exact same type of education themselves. And their grandparents receive that exact same type of education themselves. They couldn't tell you what a high functioning school looks like because they've never seen it. I asked these kids, what do you think the high school is supposed to be like? And one of them said high school musical. <laughs> and on the one hand, I was like, y'all still watch that? But on the other hand, <laughs> This is the only ideal of what a true education looks like to them because they've never seen it. In a country that is 13% black, they've never attended school with a white child in 13 years of education. That's intentional. We have chosen that. And so we all sit here and morally, we believe integration is the right thing to do. And morally, we say we believe in equality, but we sustain inequality every day. This, um, I think black children are taught to remember, you are Negroes, and as such, your place is behind. So the Negroes gives away the time frame that this quotation comes from. But there is no doubt, when I ask those children in Tuscaloosa or Detroit or New York City, what does their education say about their place, they understand this very well, that their education says that they're not worth anything more than that. This is a white education reformer. Those of you who follow me on Twitter know I'm quite critical of education reform movements because I think often education reform movements want to put a Band-Aid over the problem without actually fixing the fundamental problem, which is integration, a segregated and unequal school system, which will not simply be changed by trying to throw more money at small numbers of students, right? It requires a fundamental restructuring. And this is where, we always fall up short because to have equality, you have to give something up if you have more. We want equality, but we want advantage for our own children at the same time. Those two things are in direct conflict. You can't advantage your child because to advantage your child, you have to disadvantage someone else's child. And so I think we still are producing an education system where black students are educated uh, for the environment that they're in and not out of it. You're not giving them education that allows them to transcend their circumstances. And so that's the great lie, right? Because the fundamental belief of this country is that education is a great equalizer. But one only has to look at historic data and current data to know 
that for many, many black and brown children and a good number of poor white children, education is the albatross that keeps them where they are. It is the anchor. It does not liberate them, and we choose that. So I'm going to end where I began, because I think the challenge for all of us in this room is to ask ourselves, which side of education are we working on? Are we working on an education for democracy, and not the democracy of 1787, where 20% of our citizens were not citizens, not democracy of 1787, where women couldn't vote and where black people couldn't vote, and so democracy only included white people and largely white men, but of the democracy of today, which is a multiracial, multi-ethnic country where everyone should have the same opportunities. That is democracy. So are we educating our children for that? Or are we going to continue educating our children for oppression? With that, I think we will start the panel. Thank you.